From Quito, Ecuador, my name is Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South, the morning news feed on Telesur English. We start this new edition right now. Protests have gone into a second night in Peru against the decision by President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski to grant a pardon to the former leader, Alberto Fujimori. Thousands marched through Lima on Christmas Day, only to be met by a heavy police presence and tear gas. They were denouncing what they see as a cynical deal between Kuczynski and the Fuerza Popular Party, which is led by Fujimori's daughter, Keiko, to avoid the president's impeachment by Congress last Thursday. This is a betrayal to our homeland. We voted on the second round against Fujimori for him and he betrayed us because on different occasions he said that he would not pardon him. But he did this exchange with Fujimori in order to not be seized. And I find this unfair. And we are here today for all the victims of Barrios Altos and Cantuta. We are here fighting for them and for the memory of all Peruvians so that this doesn't happen again. It represents a mockery to all the people who believe in President Kuczynski because Fujimori is the most corrupt person, the most corrupt president that our country has had. He is the person who destroyed the country's institution, destroyed democracy, and he is a person who ignored all human rights. President Kuczynski went on television to justify his decision. He recognized that Alberto Fujimori had been responsible for many human rights abuses, but said he couldn't allow him to die in prison. I want to tell you that perhaps this has been the most difficult decision of my life. It is about the health and chances of life of a former president of Peru, who having committed excesses and grave errors, was sentenced and has already served 12 years of his sentence. Let's recall why Peru's former president Alberto Fujimori was jailed in 2006. In 2009, the country's Supreme Court sentenced Alberto Fujimori to 25 years in prison for crimes against humanity and held him responsible for the killing of 25 people from Barrios Altos and La Cantuta in 1991 and 1992. The executions happened at the hands of the paramilitary group known as the Colina Group. Fujimori also pushed several neoliberal measures and became known for planning a self-coup. He was detained in Chile and extradited to Peru in 2006, where he was jailed. In July 2016, current President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski said he was against pardoning Alberto Fujimori, a stand that changed only three days after a Fujimori majority Congress voted no to the impeachment process against President Kuczynski, who was being accused of corruption linked to the Brazilian construction company Odebrecht. Colombia's largest remaining guerrilla group, the ELN, has accused the government of breaking the terms of its truce, putting at risk at the bilateral ceasefire. In a series of tweets, the National Liberation Army says the verification mechanism has collapsed because of the intransigence of the delegates of President Santos, making it more difficult to fulfill the ceasefire agreed until January 9th. Only five of the 45 cases referred to the verification body have been evaluated. The government has unilaterally in increased operations of military control in areas where our forces are permanently stationed. It is now up to the government whether peace talks will take place under a bilateral ceasefire or in the middle of a war. At the weekend, Venezuela's Truth Commission decided to release 80 opposition activists who were in jail accused of organizing violence during four months of protests early this year. As our correspondent in Caracas, Freddy Gillingham, reports, their release is being seen as a sign that dialogue with the Venezuelan opposition is making progress. So just to give you an update on Saturday's announcement where uh, 80 detainees are set to be released. These are detainees who were arrested following the anti-government violence in 2014 and 2017. Yesterday, on Sunday morning, 36 of the detained were released. They were greeted by their friends and family. This is being described as a goodwill Christmas gesture. 
Um, however, I think it's something much more than that. I think it really shows clarity that the dialogue between the opposition and the government is really moving forward and that they are finding democratic solutions to their problems. There are more, there is another set of dialogue which is scheduled for the 11th and 12th of January. The two sides will be meeting again in Santo Domingo and let's hope that resolutions like, we, like we've seen over the weekend can continue. Thank you and back to you in the studio. That was Freddy Gillingham from Caracas. Christmas has been a difficult time for Argentina's poor. The neoliberal policies imposed by President Mauricio Macri have caused a significant growth in poverty and soup kitchens are struggling to cope with the increasing numbers seeking a decent meal. More details in the next report. Every day, social movements organize soup kitchens and mobilize on the streets of Argentina. Public protests seem to be the only way of getting the food they need to make a decent meal. We have a crisis in the soup kitchens. There are more kids and parents coming now. There's so much need. We don't have enough food for so many people. We cannot give them a good portion of food. We just don't have enough anymore. Workers in the social economy are staging intense days of protest and mobilization. They're demanding an end to layoffs and reject the pension and emergency laws that the current government is promoting and which affect the least privileged. We are very aware that without the strength of popular organization, the sectors who suffer most wouldn't be expressing themselves on the streets. It's going to be very difficult for the poor because all measures that are being taken are affecting the lives of the poor. To defend the rights already won isn't an easy task for the social movements after years of struggle. The government refuses to introduce a law of food emergency that would help to fight the desperate needs in poor neighborhoods. We think that reforms by the government will tend to flexibilize even more workers' conditions and increase unemployment in the country. The social movements accuse the government of Mauricio Macri of not having the will to pass the measure that would help to reduce hunger for thousands of Argentinians who are not able to spend a proper holiday. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. This hurricane season is finally over and has proven to be one of the most violent in recent history, ranking among the top seven most active on record. Let's take a look back at the impact the hurricane season had on the Caribbean. A total of 10 hurricanes created havoc in the Caribbean region. Six were major storms of category three or higher, and three of those were category four or higher when they made landfall. In September, Hurricane Irma hit the islands of Antigua, Barbuda, St. Martin, Anguilla, St. Kitts and Nevis, the U.S. Virgin Islands and the British Virgin Islands. Irma then moved on to Cuba, causing major damage. On the island of Barbuda, Hurricane Irma left complete devastation. An estimated 95% of structures were destroyed, three people were killed and the island was left without power or communications, leaving no choice but to evacuate the entire population of approximately 2,000 residents. Prime Minister Gaston Brown estimated that reconstruction would cost some 200 million US dollars and could take several years. Brown spoke to Telesur's Jorge Hestoso, where he described the situation after the passage of Hurricane Irma on the island as a humanitarian crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis that is now consuming Antigua. As I said to you, um, Antigua got away unscathed, so it is business as usual in Antigua. But our sister island, Barbuda, that is uh, 30 miles north of us, was just totally decimated to the extent that Barbuda today is a mangled wreck. Unfortunately, uh, Barbuda will take some time to be fully rebuilt. Venezuela immediately sent 10 tons of supplies to the Caribbean islands of Antigua and Barbuda, in addition to a roster of rescue personnel. Brown thanked Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro for his timely intervention during the hurricane, adding that he knew the Bolivarian nation would, quote, respond to the call of its Caribbean brothers. First of all, let me start by commending President Maduro for 
President Maduro and the government and people of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. I have to admit that it is their timely in intervention that would have helped to put us in the position that we're in today in terms of the response to Hurricane Irma. The U.S. and British Virgin Islands did not fare much better after Irma hit the island chains on September the 6th. According to reports, shortly after Irma moved on, 70% of the U.S. Virgin Islands' infrastructure on St. Thomas was destroyed and 100% of the utility system on the island of St. John. 40,000 people were left homeless. The Category 5 storm killed five people in the British Virgin Islands and thousands were left without electricity and water. The British government was criticized for its slow response in assisting its overseas territory after the hurricanes. Eventually, the British government did send $42 million in assistance and aid flights to the British Virgin Islands and the Anguilla Archipelago. The flights took medical supplies, emergency shelter kits, rations and clean water to affected islands, as well as engineers and military personnel. The next week, British Prime Minister Theresa May announced in Parliament more aid for Irma's victims, perhaps in response to the criticism her Conservative government received. But there was also an emphasis on military aid, soldiers and police, to protect property from what Britain called looting. And today I'm announcing an additional £25 million to support the recovery effort, further to the £32 million of assistance I announced last week. We have now deployed over 1,000 military personnel to the region, with an additional 200 to arrive in the next few days, along with over 60 police. And more than 40 tonnes of aid has now arrived. Dominica was only brushed by Hurricane Irma, but the island was not so lucky when Category 5 Hurricane Maria made landfall on September 19th. The storm is regarded as the worst natural storm ever to hit the island. In an exclusive interview with Telesu, Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt had this to say about the aftermath of this brutal storm. Well, we have uh, confirmed about 25 dead and there are about uh, 18 confirmed missing and about another 17 unconfirmed missing. Uh, so you're talking about a significant number of people who would have perished as a result of uh, Hurricane Maria. A few days after Maria's deadly blow, improved weather had seen aid arrive to the island. But according to Prime Minister Skerritt, the country was still without electricity. Little by little, some services were restored, with help from the CARICOM countries, as well as Venezuela, Cuba, Palestine, France, Britain and others. After Dominica, Maria had Puerto Rico in its sights. The hurricane caused widespread damage on September 20th and subsequently a humanitarian crisis. Several weeks after the storm, most of the island's residents still lacked access to electricity and clean water. U.S. President Donald Trump's administration came under fire for its disorganized and tepid response. Telesu traveled to Puerto Rico and spoke with some of the residents who were doing their best to overcome the tragedy with little to no federal assistance. Here there's no electricity. Look at the light pole. We don't have any water or electricity here and we haven't seen anyone fix it or clearing up the debris. We haven't seen water, just the water trucks that are helping us now. Trump visited Puerto Rico briefly on October 3rd amid protests and complaints over his administration's response to the havoc. The hurricane not only affected the people on the island, but it also shed light on the complex political relationship between Puerto Rico and the mainland. We've spent a lot of money on Puerto Rico, and that's fine. We've saved a lot of lives. If you look at the... Uh, every death is a horror. But if you look at a real catastrophe like Katrina, and you look at the tremendous hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that died, and you look at what happened here with really a storm that was just totally overpowering. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. Trump came to insult the Puerto Ricans. This is what I think. I don't know what the others think. We, the Puerto Ricans, feel offended because of the things he said. After the storms hit, the Caribbean islands looked towards recovery. But recovery comes at a price. Most of the islands were already indebted to organizations such as the IMF, and despite the natural catastrophe, were still expected to repay their debt. An international donor conference was held at the United Nations in New York on November 21st to mobilize international resources for its member states devastated by hurricanes Irma and Maria.
The Prime Minister of St. Lucia took the opportunity to vent his frustration over the bureaucracy and unfair international financial system the Caribbean region has to deal with in the wake of natural disasters. Now, it seems that we're being asked to pay two prices. One, for being located where we are and on the front line of this climate change issue. And then two, to be further penalized by the level of bureaucracy that seems to be insensitive, um, regardless of the information that's available to all of us. And what is more painful about that bureaucracy is, is that this bureaucracy only requires a pen. That is the effort that we're asking from the world today to stop the procrastination and to help us deal and help us to help ourselves. 2017's hurricane season ended on November 30th, and it was one for the record books. The possibility of more extreme weather events is increasing as climate change escalates. Only when the next year's hurricane season returns will we see if the world's governments have learned any lessons at all for the future. Honduras has spent the last month immersed in a deep political crisis, following accusations of fraud in November's elections. But long before that, the country has faced fierce conflicts over human rights, land, and the environment. In this report, we look back at how activists have demanded justice for the over 100 environmentalists murdered in the last 10 years. At a public event in the Honduran state of Colón, authorities representing the government officially recognized the murder of the former environmental activist, Carlos Escaleras, as committed by the state. The declaration was part of an agreement with the International Human Rights Commission, the victim's family, and the state. The state accepts the international responsibility for the violation of the guarantee to the right of life and the integrity of our fellow citizen, Carlos Escaleras. The family of the victim accepted the position of the state, but they also demand justice for other activists murdered in Honduras. To forget would mean that we would abandon the cause. If we forget, we will forget Carlos and we will deny justice for Janet Caguas, Carlos Luna and Berta Cáceres. Furthermore, human rights organizations linked the current situation of the Campesino groups to the sellout policies of the Campesino territories by the government. Today, the state asked for forgiveness for the assassination of Carlos Escaleras 20 years ago. But today, the same problems that he fought for still exist. The land grabbing is still happening today at the Bajo Caguán. The campesinos who Carlos Escaleras defended pointed their fingers at the state for continuing to deny campesinos the right of owning their own land and for the lack of environmental protection. The land struggle will not stop because the farmers who live in the Caguán Valley don't have the opportunity to have their own piece of land to work. The Honduran authorities compromised in order to give reparations to the family of Carlos Escaleras and more protection due to the threats that they have suffered. Gender violence has been on the rise in Brazil, but a new app aims to provide women with at least some protection from a culture steeped in sexism. It's called FemiTaxi, and it's meant to allow women to travel in safety and comfort. Gender violence has been on the rise in Brazil, but a new app aims to provide women with at least some protection from a culture steeped in machismo. It's called FemiTaxi, and it's meant to allow women to travel in safety and comfort. In Sao Paulo alone, reports of attempted rape and sexual assault have risen by over 10% this last year. And regular taxis are one of the worst places for such crimes. Many women feel safer traveling with a female driver. Separating men and women isn't a permanent solution. 
If we don't understand that we are different, we will always be separated. I think that the taxi is a tool to fight for space, to show my work, so I can be seen as a worker and not an object. When Femi Taxi appeared, it provided me safety during a time when I didn't have the support of being seen as a worker. So we women are helping each other. We stand to show society that we can also do this job. Femi Taxi now has 1,000 drivers and provides more than 20,000 rides per month in six cities across the country. Founder Charles Henri Calfat said he plans to expand into two more Brazilian cities in coming months, then Mexico and Argentina early next year. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Now let's take a look at our war news roundup. Polls have opened in Liberia's presidential election runoff with fewer voters turning out compared to the first round according to an election agent. Voters will choose between Joseph Boakai, the vice president, who has been in government for 12 years, and former soccer star George Weah. Even though less people turned out, the atmosphere was calm. What I've seen today, uh, the turnout seemed to be kind of less than what we had uh, during the first round. Uh, but uh, I think, just as I said before, that because it is well organized now and people know where to go to vote, the first round of the China-Afghanistan-Pakistan Foreign Minister's Dialogue was held in Beijing. The three countries have exchanged ideas on several topics, including political trust and reconciliation, development, cooperation and counterterrorism. China and Pakistan will look at extending their $57 billion China-Pakistan Economic Corridor to Afghanistan. The successful implementation of CPAC projects will serve as a model for enhancing connectivity and cooperation through similar projects with neighboring countries including Afghanistan, Iran and with Central and West Asia. Tropical storm Tembin has weakened while passing southern Vietnam and continues to lose strength as it headed westward, according to Vietnamese authorities. Nearly a million people were told to prepare for evacuation and some 70,000 people were moved from low-lying areas to nearby schools. Tembin killed at least 240 people after passing through the Philippines. An Israeli court extended the custody of three Palestinian women on Monday who were detained after a viral video of an alleged assault on Israeli soldiers in the occupied West Bank. In the viral video, the footage shows the women approaching two Israeli soldiers before shoving, kicking and slapping them while filming on mobile phones. Controversial security measures taken by the United Arab Emirates against Tunisian women trying to travel to the Gulf states were prompted by fears of a terrorist attack, Tunisia said on Monday. Since Friday, Tunisian women and girls have been delayed for hours as they look to board planes for the UAE, sparking outcry in the North African nation that led to the suspension of Emirates airline flights to Tunis. Pastoral communities from the north of Kenya are denouncing that the Maasai community is affected by a police operation. We have this special report. The Samburu parliament unanimously decided to break its silence and denounce the killing of cows in Laikipia. It was tribal and also political. They believe these police raids are meant to a big Maasai minister from Laikipia and Samburu for political and tribal reasons. One tribe in Laikipia is trying to get out Samburu out of, out of Laikipia in order for them to take up the, the Samburu land. So they are trying to use the force, armed personnel of the government, to get Samburus out of Laikipia. Simply because they wanted to replace or take over the land being owned by Samburus. The race happened in communal lands and the ministers were not criminals, but future unhappy voters, according to parliamentarians. They are trying to, to criminalize them that they are, these are criminals, while well, they are not. They are making these people to be useless. Samburu families came back to the pastoral communities north of Laikipia, although most of the land was already sold. The Samburu got to elect a congressman during the last elections, 
but the Samburu lands are being affected by climate change, especially during the dry season and by the activities of private ranches. The prominent government people are also using means to make sure that Samburus get out of the land so that when the leases expire, the, ranges, uh, the, the leases for the ranches expire in the near future, then they will take up the land so easily. What is happening is that the Maasai community, the land historically belonged to the Maasai people, but now there's a lot of pressure from this elite, you know, who are continuing in widening the gap between the rich and the poor to push the Maasai out. The pastoral communities are preparing a plan to improve their resilience. Because of this, they are focusing the dialogue on the state action against the pastoral communities and the indigenous rights. From Samburu land, Oscar Epelde for Telesur. Mexico celebrates the festive season with an emblematic plant which only grows in this country, what it is known as the Christmas Eve plant. Other countries call it the Easter flower or the Inca crown. Our correspondent in Mexico City sent this special report. The Aztecs named this plant Quetla Xochitl and used it to create pigments and herbal remedies as an offering to Tonatzin, the earth goddess. When the Aztecs were evangelized, it received the name of Christmas Eve, a flower that is cultivated for nine months. We plant the seed in March and take care of it until May. In June, we do something called pinchada. We cut the tips of the plant so that more flowers are born. This plant comes from Mexico and is currently the most sold flower in the world. This year alone, farms planted 25 million seeds all around the country. They are very delicate. We have to water it flower by flower, one by one. And we also have to feed it at least twice a week with compost, special fertilizers that we use according to the plant's growth. Ana Gomez's family has cultivated this flower for generations. This activity has become the financial support of thousands of people from Milpa Alta, Tlalhuac, Tlalpan, Iochimilco to the country's capital. This time of year is very meaningful for us because we have clients that have been coming for years now. We have couples that got married and the next year they come with their kids. We become part of their family traditions. This star-shaped flower with more than 300 varieties has become a symbol of the festivities. It's a way to remember Christmas, to see things with life and color. The strong red color of the flowers is what I enjoy the most. The cultivation of the Christmas Eve plant has created more than 3,000 jobs and has sold more than $23 million worth, especially in the states located in the center and south of the country. In Europe, people have named it the friendship flower because of its beauty and color. And we've come to the end of this morning news brief. This and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching. Telesur features the developments of science and technology that innovate and make the world go around. Eso es Atom, transmitimos desde América Latina. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Technology available to everybody. Atom. Monday, only on Telesur. Different causes motivate people to look for new horizons. We'll have the right to move freely beyond the imposed walls. 
Imaginary lines are shown between the hostility towards Tom. Y la oportunidad de otros para forjar nuevos caminos. Buscamos la respuesta a las inquietudes del siglo XXI. Between borders. Thursdays only.